All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Sean Campbell, who is in Portland, Oregon. How are you doing, Sean? Uh, doing great. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. And Sean is the co-founder and CEO of Cascade Insights. And what we're going to talk about today is the great subject, how market research can be used to gain insights into customers. Now, Sean, let's, let's start at the, at the very beginning here, because I'm not sure that everybody understands what market research is and what it isn't and how it helps and how it works. Because so, you often have people will say in the company, OK, let's do this. Oh, well, do a bit of research on it. And they go off and they think, OK, I've done some market research. But what is real market research? Um. Real market research is um, typically best considered kind of an unbiased view of whatever your business problem is. Um, and, and interestingly enough, unbiased doesn't necessarily mean you hired somebody external to do it for you. Right. Um, you can run a process internal to the organization that generates unbiased results. I, I, I wouldn't even caveat that. Like some people might say, and yeah, but you really should, I mean, I think it's more about are you running an appropriate process to generate the insights and are you kind of assigning the right people to collect that? Uh, if you do that, that can be done with internal or external resources. Right. So then uh, before you start, I mean, how do you go about defining, OK, what, what kind of data you're going to look for and how you're going to go about collecting it and whom you're going to be collecting it from? Um, well, usually a, a different, a slightly different way, starting point, usually, I think, for folks is that. Um, you know, I say in regards to our services, we either get hired for pain or opportunity. Right. Um, so I would say the initial thing is to define what side of the scale that's on for you, because it leads to different research methodologies and different approaches. If you're being kind of hired or you're doing research for pain, that's typically competitor driven. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's self-inflicted. You know, you just shipped a horrible product or you have a bad sales process, or you have horrifically bad marketing. But more often than not, it's driven by kind of a competitor doing better than you. And then opportunity is driven by your desire to go access another part of the marketplace, another industry, another market segment. Um, you're doing an attach play, and you're kind of building out your solution. You acquired someone else, and you want to understand how to fold that in. So I'd say you start there, and then off of that, then those two pockets leads you to different research approaches and kind of outcomes from the research. Uh, and then obviously, I mean, a critical part of the research process, like you said, unbiased is, is actually not, not kind of being tempted to look for, you know, confirmation of everything is, is correct, you know, but really do proper, you know, be, be properly discerning. Yeah, well, there's there's so many places in a research effort that you can you can tilt the results. I mean, from the very beginning, the most obvious place is who you choose as a candidate. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a saying around here that I think is true of a number of market research firms, whether they've coined it this way or not. But we say right people, right questions. And meaning if you have the right people in the study and you ask the right questions, you're almost guaranteed to end up with right outcomes, right mm -hmm. outcomes being actual actionable intelligence. And that you can you can make business decisions on, and so frequently, probably the main thing that people get wrong is they don't put the right people in it. Uh, one of the most common mistakes is sending out surveys to just your current customers. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, unless you're horrible, they already like you. Uh, they already do want to buy more stuff from you. They tend to like your support. They tend to like your sales team. They tend to like the product. Otherwise, they would not be a current customer. Now, if you have a horrible churn rate. Okay, well, yes, absolutely talk to your current customers because it sounds like many of them will not be customers in the near future. And so then that's a different kind of research. But if you're talking about a standard environment where your company's not, you know, flying straight down into the ground yeah. uh, trajectory wise, you know, talking to your own customers probably doesn't lead to like a massive amount of insight. So on the right people side, we usually angle people say, start to recruit competitor customers. And that's instantly an interesting challenge for them because, of course, you already have a list of your own customers. You don't have a list of competitor customers, yeah. but there are ways to not so much obtain that list, but to basically identify those customers and recruit them. And then the other thing is talking to the people that are somewhat the agnostics. I mean, 
there's a lot of value of talking to people who've yet to activate as a customer for either one of you. I mean, in most, because in most marketplaces, except the most mature ones, you're not trying to steal business from the other guy. You're trying to activate the other part of the market that hasn't decided on either one of you. I mean, there mm -hmm. are exceptions to that, like the mobile sure. phone market. Well, you either use iOS or Android and a few other operating systems that all of us forget as quickly as we're told them, mm -hmm. right? So outside of a, a major marketplace like that, you know, more often than not, you're fighting for that extra white space, not, not that, you know, proverbial red ocean per se, uh, you know, that is already occupied by your competitor. Yeah. And, and I think an, another thing that I think sometimes people fall into the trap and I do, I agree with you totally. I mean, I think a lot of us fall into the trap of surveying our own customers and uh, which is, you know, it's nice. You get good, good insights and all of that, but not the type that we're looking for here as in the market research. And then I guess it's how you construct your outreach, you know, if it's surveys or whatever, how do you do those most effectively? Because, um, you know, it's really hard to get people to fill in stuff nowadays. Well, some of that, yeah, yeah. I mean, some of that is um, definitely even driven by the right people side, because if you're surveying the wrong people, where well, they're going to ignore the outreach, right? Or they're going to feel like they already communicated with you. But yeah, at the top line, you have to make the initial outreach for the research somewhat compelling. I mean, we say around here that like our outreach team that does the recruiting in a way acts a bit like an inbound sales function, mm -hmm. um, you know, like an SDR team would, because you, you need to craft that message the right way to get a busy business stakeholder to respond to requests for research. Um, and that's not just selling them on the research so much as like, also, <laughs> I, I've said for years that if you say to somebody, they're smart about something and you ask, can you talk to them for 30 minutes about said thing, they almost will always give you said 30 minutes. I, it's just like a lot. I mean, so, so a lot of the outreach is basically saying, we really think you're pretty smart about this based on what we know about you. We would love to have your insights fill in, you know, a gap in our study. And that tends to have really great success. The, the other part of your statement, though, about like people are tired of filling stuff out, that's really a methodological approach. I mean, yeah. very frequently research team, not research teams, but internal teams inside a company like a team of marketers, they'll reach for the proverbial web survey. Right. And they'll go to Survey Monkey, Survey Gizmo. Mm -hmm. I mean, Survey Monkey is now called Momentum AI, but I still think of them as Survey Monkey sometimes. Sure. But the um, you know, they will um they will turn to that because it is a very easy thing to self-administer. Splat yeah. a bunch of questions in a survey, send it out. But if you went and looked at not just the academic literature, but just even the business literature around survey design. It's a whole separate industry unto itself, how to design a really well-constructed survey instrument and not have one be so long. You know, probably the biggest thing we beat back clients on is, um, can I have my survey be 600 questions or whatever? Yeah. And we're like, you know, no one is, they're all gonna stop answering. So mm -hmm. you, you have this kind of length of the survey instrument problem. And, and, and the flip side to that is, while in-depth interviews and focus groups and these more qualitative approaches don't always lead to the same amount of statistical rigor as a quantitative approach. They don't generate instant yeah, pie, sure. pie charts and bar graphs and whatever. You can actually, in some cases, develop a lot more depth and even ask perhaps more questions than you would in the survey because it's just more engaging for the person that you're talking to. And mm -hmm. it's, it's just one of those weird things. I, I still think it's kind of odd when you think about it. You know, Somebody will take a web survey that technically is less invasive in terms of the amount of time on their calendar. And they will, you know, they'll time out after five, 10, 15 minutes and they'll be like, this is way too much. I got no more time for this thing. I'm done. But you call somebody up and you say, you know, you're a rocket scientist on this subject. Yeah. I really want to talk to you. They will spend an hour with you. Yeah. Which yeah, their no, bill I... rate might be $600 an hour or something, right? You know what I mean? And yet they're, it, so what you have there is that, that psychological interplay of it's not just what you're asking and who you're asking. It's how they feel valued by the ask, which is another layer of the whole process that sometimes gets skipped. Yeah, and I think that's a fabulous point, uh, Sean, that people should take that on board. Yeah, because, I mean, you don't sometimes when you when you get a survey, you just think, oh, yeah, I've just been a, a random bunch of people. And here I am, you know, just one of them, one of many. And if you're maybe I will, maybe I won't fill it out. But you're right about the the inter if the interaction was one to one. The, the other thing I think. And this is something you probably have to guide people with a lot is 
trying to ask too many different things when you're doing your mark, like instead of focusing on, you know, the things that are really important, like trying, because I, I often say like, if somebody thinks, oh, you're doing some research or market research, oh, this department wants to know something, this other department would love to know something. So suddenly you get kind of a smorgasbord rather than focus. Yeah, that happens a fair amount. I mean, if we send in a discussion guide, which is the main uh, uh, document that's used to guide a qualitative interview, let's say, or we send in the first draft of a survey instrument, um, they only get longer <laughs> when we send them in. I mean, they only get longer and people add more and more things to the kitchen sink. Now, on one hand, that's a positive thing because it means that we're addressing an audience that those stakeholders care about, right? They have many yeah. different emails they could respond to their inbox. If they're going to spend time telling us what they want us to do on the research and add additional questions, well, at least they're, they have a passion and an interest. Yeah. But you're right you know, you have to leave enough room to explore a topic well enough to provide a meaningful answer. And honestly, there's a fairly simple way out of that, uh, that I found is that a lot of times I'll say, hey, that's great. You know, it's wonderful that you made the discussion guide 87 pages, or the survey instrument now has 700 questions. But when we get to the readout, and we're with your peers, and other stakeholders, which is always code for your boss and your grand boss, yeah, and, yeah, you know, yeah. whoever else in the room, um, when we try to justify a point we're making, I don't want to be able to justify it with only three interviews or five survey responses. So I need an instrument that is short enough that I can basically give it to a large enough population and be sure that they'll give us solid answers to all of those things. So that then when somebody says, well, as, as always happens in all market research readouts, um, and I think should happen, the client should scrap with the findings a bit. I mean, they came into the, the readout, these senior leaders right. and stakeholders with opinions. I want yeah. them to have opinions and they're gonna scrap with the findings and we give them. And then I wanna be able to say, you know, valid opinion backed up by what we learned or, you know, great intuitive opinion. It's wrong uh, based <laughs> on the data that we found. And, and if you say it wrong, especially you don't wanna say it's based off of a limited set of data yeah. you want to be able to back that up and most of the time and you know most of the time when i lay that out sometimes in a shorter or longer form it, people picture in their mind's eye sitting in that readout trying to justify to a vice president why they only have so much data about a given question and they go you're right okay we'll stop we're, we're going to make this shorter um but but part of and part of that too is sometimes noticing a little duplicity in in business objectives and sometimes you can mm -hmm. kind of cover the same objective with a smaller set of questions and there's certainly some shaping that can go on there too how much has uh, how much has market research changed over the last number of years sean and what, where, do you, where do you think it's going from here because obviously you've got a lot more tools at your disposal but you've also got a very distracted i would say audience out there well on the latter point uh, everybody still wants to think they're smart and they legitimately are about something. So I don't think that's really changed. I think I think smart market research recruiting um, in some ways has gotten way easier as evidenced by expert networks and all kinds of different entities that came out. I mean, LinkedIn for all its greatness and its sins um, created the database of databases of business professionals that's, that's pseudo public in a way that the old school guard of like Hoover's and organizations that, you know, the Lexus Nexuses of the world um, only dreamed of 30 years ago or 20 years ago or 15 years ago, well, 15 years ago, link, my, I think my LinkedIn profile started in 2004. So 15 years ago, be too close. But like, um, and so anyway, I, I think recruiting has only gotten easier in a way, because we have so much data about who we're targeting. So if you're doing it in a smart way, I think it's easier uh, than mm -hmm. it perhaps was before. Um, as far as like other changes, there's definitely a huge amount of what we refer to as open source intelligence. You know, it used to be a day where a market research team, not us, but certain market research teams would even sneer at social media data or right. certain kind of streams. All, all that's folded naturally into. I think from a the target audience we go after, you know, SaaS companies and cloud companies, they have an incredible amount of usage data. And pattern tracking data on like kind of user bases and what they're doing and what features they're not activating and how they're activating. And that's that's a massively incredibly useful data. And if you contrast that with 10, 15 years ago with on-premise software and the limited amount of telemetry you would get from an on-premise instance, uh, comparatively, 
uh, you know, I, I think that's amazing. I think there's definitely kind of a weariness around the way quantitative research is done. Mm -hmm. um, I know there's some who are listening that'll be like, there's so many ways it's done differently. And I'm like, that yeah, kind of, I mean, web surveys are still kind of the default in so many yeah. ways. And so um, on the qualitative side, there's some really cool things with textual analysis and AI analysis and things that are happening. So I, um, I think there's definitely some areas that have gone a little stagnant. And then there's, there's some things that, that frankly are just easier with the digital footprint of folks in the lane we're in. Again, I'm speaking from a B2B sure. research standpoint. Mm -hmm. I, 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 you'd have to have somebody else on to talk about business to consumer, but uh, at least from my standpoint, I feel like some things have gotten easier and more interesting. And then a few areas have gotten a little more tired. And I think we're looking for some, some meaningful refreshes there, not just some kind of frosting or you know, wrapping on the present, but something that's mm -hmm. actually meaningful. And I think the other thing that you just touched on there, though, about, yeah, I mean, being a SaaS company ourselves and that, um, yeah, the, you have access to a, a ton of data that you never had access to, be, access to before, which is a great thing. On the flip side, you then have to focus on you know, what data is important as opposed to data that's nice to know or kind of mildly interesting and stuff so i think because sometimes people can just get sucked into like more is more you know the more data the better but you've got to figure out which is the data that's meaningful oh yeah yeah i mean uh people before us have said correlation is not causation causation you know i mean like i mean they're they're not you, you can draw any two trend lines from meaningless data and say that it it mean something in the end. So um, I, you're right. Uh, but I, I guess in the end, I'd, I'd rather have lots of data and have to decide what's meaningful mm -hmm. than, than flying a little more blind like we did in the on-premise era. Uh, so I uh, honestly, I think SaaS companies are sitting on just such a treasure trove of information. I mean, they, they, ha they have things they have to watch out for in terms of how they use it, not just from a business standpoint, but ethically too. Sure. But mm -hmm. I just think from a I mean, a product manager, if you pulled them out of 1991 and they're deploying something like, you know, I don't know, what would be in, in market then? Some version of Office or Windows XP or whatever, right? Yeah. And they're trying mm -hmm. to decide what new features to put in it. And you shoved them over to today's future and they worked on Google Sheets. They would just be over the moon with the amount of data they have to make intelligent decisions, right? So, so I think all in all, it's a huge positive. It just has yeah. to be handled the right way. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Then maybe maybe there would have been like uh, 9,000 less features in some of those office products when they realized they <laughs> use them. <laughs> well, my, fav my favorite quick vignette on that was, um, I remember somebody once, this was a few years ago, a number of years ago, in fact, which, which also is telling just by the nature of what I'm about to say, said that um, somebody on Microsoft Office team and said to me a number of years ago, 90% of our feature requests are already in the product. <laughs> right. That's which hilarious. to your point, you know, I mean, so, yeah. so, I mean, not to say that SaaS solutions don't have feature bloat. Sure, I mean, um, you know, I mean, there's plenty of SaaS solutions that do, but you're right. It's a little faster to go, gosh, there's a black hole there with that menu option. We, no one really uses that. So it's either education or we named it wrong, or it's just, useless so one, yeah. one of the three at least and we got to decide yeah no it's great it is it is very good uh, uh, to be able to have that kind of insight today so yeah i think it's only Im improving things um so sean uh, all of sean's information is going to be below the video but please before we go explain to people a little more about yourself and and cascade insights Sure, sure. So I think some of it's already leaked out. Um, so like, you know, we basically only work with B2B technology companies, which for us, we, we basically mean kind of cloud companies and some hardware companies. And for them, we do market research and we either help them kind of identify market pain and help analyze that or help them with market opportunity. And uh, once we're done doing that, we also will occasionally go around and help them activate those findings with some marketing efforts we do for them on their behalf. Uh, but the core of the organization always starts with a data-driven focus. And so we'll usually start an uh, uh, opportunity with a new client with some kind of market research initiative. And uh, been around since 2006. We've got about 30 or so people here based in Portland, but we're across the U.S. now. Uh, so, you know, if you're ever looking to work for an organization like ours, we're always happy to 
to talk to new people too. Yeah, they're no, great. Yeah, so if you uh, if you love uh, if you love data if you love uh, market research, then uh, check them out. As I said, all of the uh, links and all the information will be below this video. So again, Sean, thanks for today. It's great insights. Uh, thank you for watching or listening, and I'll see you all again soon. Thank you. Mm -hmm.